We're talking about Kafka, and Kafka is an open source project. Uh, it's an open source project we made, um, and that's kind of the backbone of this data pipeline. So, so that's the that's the topic of my talk. Um, so, so as I said, I mean the central problem is you know you you have a website like LinkedIn or any other website, and you have this continuous stream of of activity and other data that's that's flowing into the system, and you want to be able to capture it and process it for different uh, different types of applications. Um, the basic examples of these for a website are going to be tracking and logging. This is the classic thing I think everybody understands. It's typically a, you know, who, what, where, when, um, what's happening on your website, what are users doing. Um, the, the, another one is metric data. This is usually what's happening on servers, um, any kind of like, you know, disk, CPU. Uh, you typically have lots and lots of little counters and other kinds of data. RPC trace data is another thing in this category. Um, messaging and queuing is, is very similar. So, so messaging and queuing systems have been around forever. Um, they you know, basically buffer between online and offline uh, processing. You might, for example, put something into a, into a queue and then send out an email off the queue. And it, it decouples the, uh, the putting it into the queue from the, the actual email send, which might take longer. Um, and finally, change capture, which is you know, database updates, uh, new uh, changes to primary data. So, so I think all of these streams are common to, to any website, and I think other, other kinds of systems have uh, very, very similar problems. And so the, the purpose of a messaging system is basically to decouple uh, the production of all of this data from the things that consume it. You want lots of people to be able to use the data, and you want to be able to get it into your Hadoop cluster, um, and you don't want the things which are getting the data to be tied in any way to the things producing the data. Um, so, so I think... We started out at LinkedIn with um, you know, a system which you would basically just call log aggregation. We're basically kind of you know, R syncing up uh, log files and getting them into our Hadoop cluster, getting them into a, you know, Oracle data warehouse. And, and the, system, the system Kafka that we built is meant to be kind of the next generation for us of, of this. Um, so what we looked at was we looked at a lot of like, you know, log aggregation approaches, and we looked at these messaging systems uh, like JMS or RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, there's proprietary ones. Um, and so we really like the model of messaging systems where you're publishing all of this uh, you know, message data and you're subscribing to it. That's a very clean model. But actual um, investigation found they weren't, they weren't uh, a very good fit. So I'll talk a little bit about that and I'll talk a little bit about kind of the, the design considerations that led us to, to build something from scratch. So, so as we started to look at the problem, there's a few hard pieces, right? So one is persistence. You want to provide a, a persistent log that's kind of a, a, a buffer of all of the activity data that's being produced. Um, you want to be able to scale this horizontally by adding machines. That's kind of a basic uh, requirement for anything that's coupled to all of the page views on a site or all of the activity on a site, right? It's going to be a, a very large scalability problem. Um, so you want to you want to provide uh, simple semantics that people can understand who are subscribing to this. When do I get my data? What guarantees do I have? That kind of thing. Um, and I think those those are kind of the, the hard problems that we're you know working on for this system. So I'm going to dive now a little bit into one of the use cases, uh, which is tracking. And and so tracking is um, for LinkedIn. It's you know activities like what searches are people doing, what page views are happening on the site. Uh, which invitations are being sent, uh, impressions of things like, oh, we showed this ad, or we showed this uh, little widget thing, or there was these results in such and such. Um, so, so typically what this means is you're, you're, you're writing lots of data for each page view. right? So the, the, the write load is going to be very high. Um, you're going to have kind of billions of these events per day. Um, and a lot of these events have multiple consumers. So multiple people are interested in uh, who's sending invitations or what page views are happening, right? So, so the most obvious is the Hadoop system, right? You want to load all of this data up for offline processing and queries. Uh, but there's a lot of other use cases, right? So uh, websites, large websites have security systems that shut down abusive behavior. That needs to happen essentially in real time, and it needs to subscribe to these feeds as well. Um, so we, we have like a news uh, feed on the, on the home page of all the activity that's happening in your network on LinkedIn, right? So, so activities that are happening need to be fed into that. Uh, there's email updates about things that are happening, right? So there's a lot of uses for um, 
all of this activity data. Um, any kind of relevance computation is also going to happen off that. So what's popular? Uh, what has a high click-through rate? Uh, those kinds of things tend to be very important for news, ads, anything like that. Um, so this is, this is the, the problem we wanted to solve. We wanted to basically provide access to these feeds. We wanted to be able to support real-time consumers, which always pick up their messages right away. Um, like the security system, and we wanted to be able to support uh, offline consumers like Hadoop that might only load data every, you know, 15 minutes, every hour, whatever, some offline uh, time frame. So, so overall, you end up with a system like this, right? You're kind of publishing data onto this uh, message bus thing in the center. There's, there's uh, near real-time services which are plucking messages off of this, uh, I don't know, bus. And, and then finally, at the very back, there's offline systems which are sucking in, you know, the full feed of everything. Uh, and providing a very long retention period over, over a period of time. Um, so a so few more details on our implementation. We're basically using Avro serialization and, and Avro file in Hadoop. And Avro is uh, you know, providing compatibility with all the tools, and it gives us some ability to reason about uh, what's in the data. Right? So we want to maintain structure, fields, type information throughout the entire pipeline. Um, so Kafka itself, which is the message bus piece, doesn't require any particular serialization. This is just LinkedIn's usage. We always use Avra, right? So this gives us the ability to enforce backwards compatibility so that the people publishing a particular message can't change the format and break everybody using it. That's a pretty important piece. Uh, likewise, it provides a way to, to map into the type systems of Hive and Pig. And so what that means is um, people can make up all kinds of new things that they want to track and send out events. Uh, and they will immediately be sucked up. They'll be registered in Hive as Hive tables. The type information will be available for pig uh, so that you don't have to use you know, uh, zero as your field name. You'll get the right type, and you'll get the right field name in pig automatically. Um, and so, so this, was, this was kind of our goal. And we wanted to make sure there was no work done on a per data type basis. So if, you want, if new data comes in, Nobody knows. It just gets sucked up and added in. There's no uh, work to load that data. There's no you know, file a ticket to get your lo data loaded or anything like that. Um, so this, this becomes important as you have more and more uh, sources of data. And for us, I think we had, we had a few hundred, and it was growing pretty quickly. And so we obviously didn't want to be doing any custom work uh, for each new data source. So, so when we looked into how to build this, um, we thought, well, we can try and use some existing thing. Um, maybe we'll try to use some of these messaging systems. They provide real-time access for messages. Uh, so we looked at JMS. JMS was not a great fit. Um, it's not cross-language, so it only really supports Java. Um, the API is not great. And a lot of the JMS brokers basically have pretty weak uh, distributed support. So it's, the JMS itself doesn't mention anything about distribution, and most of the individual brokers have kind of ad hoc distributed support. So the assumption is most people run one server some crazy people will have a couple, right? And for us, we really wanted to focus on this case of, you know, you always have more than one. Uh, that's the default. Um, and so, so the other problem we found with messaging systems is they typically don't scale very well with large data sets. What that means is as long as everybody picks up their messages immediately, it works great, right? If, if anybody is slow, for example, your Hadoop cluster, maybe it only consumes every hour, then this backlog of messages will usually kill the system. Right? And that's a critical problem with, I think, a lot of the messaging systems out there, um, is that they, they're basically not built to handle a large, persistent, disk-based backlog of data. So that's obviously a pretty severe problem, because one of the things you want to do is really decouple the consumers from the producers of this data, um, so that you know, if, if they stop consuming for a period of time, maybe a couple hours while your Hadoop system is down for maintenance, or maybe uh, you know, something gets shut down for a couple hours for whatever, that's fine. They can pick up wherever they left off, and the data will still be there for them. OK. So we also looked at some of uh, some log aggregation approaches. We had been doing this. I think Flume was not quite out there at that time, but Scribe was. And it was, it's a very nice, mature piece of software, uh, as is Flume. They're both, they're both very good. Um, so I, th I think we ended up going down our own path uh, with this, primarily because of, of two uh, key differences. One, we wanted to focus on real-time consumers as kind of a first-class citizen. So scaling real-time consumers, partitioning up consumption, that was, a, that was a key use case for us. And the other is we really wanted to, to keep the messaging paradigm where um, producers push data into the system and consumers pull data out. This is subtle, but that's actually very important when you're talking about high load. The reason is because if you're pulling data out when you consume, you know exactly the maximum rate you can pull data at. Right? If somebody is pushing data onto you, 
uh, you don't have a lot of control, and you have to work out some prototype to kind of throttle. So, so we, we had done that. We'd done it the other way. Uh, we had a lot of problems um, really getting to high utilization and not overwhelming the downstream consumers, right? So it's, it's easy to do it if you just run everyone at low utilization, but um, so, so that's the difference. I think, I think the, key, the key thing to note here is for activity data, at least at LinkedIn, what we see is even in a very narrow time period, um, like even within seconds, the difference between the, the mean rate of data production um, and the maximum rate of data production is around 30 or 40%. So if you pull, all you have to do is keep up with the average, but if somebody pushes to you, you have to keep up with the maximum, right? And, and so that's, that's a pretty significant difference in you know, hardware or whatever else you would have to budget to, to take care of that. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Kafka implementation. This is the kind of backbone piece of software. This is what we've open sourced. Um, so it's, I think for about six months now, it's been an open source project. Uh, we just uh, started the process to add it as a Apache incubator. So I think the vote is still open. You can, you can vote for it or against it uh, if you want to. Um, okay, so, so the API is very simple. The, the, the person producing messages just calls send, and they give a topic that they want to associate their messages with. And they can send more than one message in a batch if they like. They can send just one, or they can send a group of them, right? Likewise, the person processing messages uh, is basically going to get some kind of stream. So this, this code is kind of pseudo Java, but we actually have clients in a bunch of languages, but you have to pick something to put on the slide. Um, so you, you'll get kind of a, you know, an iterator or whatever over the infinite stream of messages, and then you can process that. The interesting thing to note about this is on the receiving side, that code can actually be scaled out over a bunch of machines, and the stream will be divided up uh, amongst all the processing machines. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the details of that, like how do you divide it up and what does that mean? Um, so, so a few implementation details about Kafka. It's, it's written in Scala, which is a uh, you know, fancy version of Java, I guess. Um, the, it's just kind of you know, standalone jar with uh, NIO-based APIs. Uh, we're using Zookeeper for a lot of the election to balance load over consumers, to register what data is available. When I said that uh, we discover any kind of new data produced and load it in Hadoop, that's what that's based on. Um, and then it has a very simple protocol for communicating back and forth and a bunch of clients. I think actually yesterday we got a, a Go client, which is the Google programming language. I don't know if that's useful to anybody. But, um, okay, so, so the basic ideas we had for implementation were to, to avoid any kind of random access uh, persistent data structures. So this is what kills your message queues. So if you try and keep a B tree over everything or you try and use a database, it works very well um, until you get a fair amount of data and then it's going to get much slower. Um, we wanted to allow very parallel consumption. So for example, our Hadoop clusters are going to be much larger than our um, Kafka cluster, right? So, so I would say the ratio is like maybe you know, 10 to 1 or something. And so we, we have to be able to support uh, lots of consumers doing these data loads. Um, and finally, I, I mentioned a little bit about push and pull. And, and finally, and, and in addition, we wanted this to be explicitly distributed, meaning the software is built from the ground up to work as a single system spread across machines. That means that you need to handle some kind of you know, machines coming offline, um, you know, new consumers springing up, that kind of stuff. Um, so, so the performance, this was the first focus. If you can't get good single node performance, you're kind of doomed in this problem. So, so, so these are the single node performance numbers. They're, they're pretty good. It's about what you can get through the system um, and write to disk. Um, so you'll notice that producing is a little bit faster than consuming, about 2x, right? That has to do with writing to the file system being a bit slower. Uh, the, key, the key difference for performance is, you know, how much do you batch? How much do you batch into a single network request? How much do you batch into a single disk write? And obviously, this is the more batching case. If you batch less, you're going to have more file system writes, and it'll be a bit slower. If you want to know more about this, uh, we have a performance page on the website, and it goes into a lot of different scenarios you can work through. Uh, the other thing that you have to do, right, it's good to get that high throughput, but you need to make sure that as the data size on disk grows, your performance remains constant. So that's what this graph is, right? We have on one side the number of messages uh, sitting in backlog uh, in the queue or whatever. And on the other side, um, we have the, the throughput that you can produce at that time. And as you can see, basically the, the amount of messages you've received so far has essentially no effect on the rate at which you can produce you know, and, and consume those messages. Um, so there's a few tricks to get this. Uh, basically, um, we want to kind of single thread, um, 
or sorry, we, so the, the tricks are these, right? So, so first of all, we want to uh, only append and avoid basic seeks. So there's, there's not a lot of uh, complex metadata associated with this. We have kind of a very simple write-ahead log uh, that we're maintaining data into, and we're splitting that up by topic and partitions among those topics. Um, we're also doing end-to-end -end message batching, uh, which means that, that batches of messages can be put together on the producer side, and that batching can be maintained throughout, right? And what that means is a single, a single uh, network operation is actually getting multiple net, uh, messages through. That's how you're going to get above, you know, say, 20,000 or 40,000 messages per second. You have to batch to do that. Uh, finally, we're using a, a zero-copy network implementation. This is similar to how HDFS works, um, where you're basically transferring data directly from the kernel uh, op, you know, page cache to, to the socket. This avoids you know, a full recopy, actually a couple of recopies through. So it's a good efficiency gain, and it's one of the reasons you see so much better um, consumer uh, performance. That's where we get that 2x. OK. Um, so distribution, this is how, uh, this is the classic problem if you work on uh, infrastructure for internet companies. It's how do you make many computers look like one computer? Um, and so what we're doing here is um, the Kafka nodes, the brokers that are taking the data, are registering themselves in ZooKeeper. The producers are kind of flinging data wherever, uh, at least in our tracking setup. Um, and the consumers are dividing up work amongst themselves to consume. So, so it's not that complicated. Uh, this is what it would look like. Um, so interestingly, in our design, basically consumer state is uh, maintained kind of as part of the consumer API, which means the brokers are basically stateless. They just serve chunks of data out to people. Um, so w a few of the important implications of this is, one, uh, if you want to reload data, you can. This is important for kind of like a, an ETL system design. If you need to start over your Hadoop load from this morning, you know, rewind back in time and reprocess, you can do that. Uh, the data is actually still there. Uh, the brokers are stateless. They just maintain data for a period of time, like n days, and then they throw it away. So we, we maintain data for five days. So the SLA with clients is, we'll have your data for five days, and then it will be gone. Um, So an, another question around like messaging and semantics um, is, you know, you typically have this no notion of like publish subscribe, where if you publish a message, everybody gets it, and then you have queues, which is if you publish a message, one person will get it, right? And what you find usually for internet system usage is neither of those are very good. What you actually have is your consumers are logically made up of a bunch of machines, and there's multiple con consumers. So when you publish a message, you want this group to get it and that group to get it, and you only want one machine in every group to get it. And so that's, that's our semantics. I think it's, it's a generalization of queues and topics. It, it kind of does both, right? Which is, um, for each group, uh, exactly one consumer in that group will get the message, and that does the work sharing. Um, and having multiple groups does the publish subscribe part of it. Um, so, so another feature that's kind of important for the overall uh, data pipeline, if you have more than one data center, um, is the ability to uh, mirror these clusters or kind of replicate from one to the other, right? So, so for us, we have live data centers, and then we have Hadoop actually in a couple data centers which are not, not in the same place, right, even in, in the same part of the country. Um, and so we're, we're basically loading from live data centers into a, a centralized Kafka cluster that's co-located with Hadoop, and then we're loading off of that uh, into Hadoop and into other systems as well. So the Hadoop integration is actually very straightforward. It's just an input format and output format. Um, the input format is what we're using for all our ingestion, ETL, sucking in data, uh, and the output format is, is how you publish data and get it out. Um, and that, that's used to publish data back to production. Um, so, so the final topic I want to talk about is a, a little bit of a um, diversion from what I have been talking about. So th what I've been talking about so far is just kind of getting data from one place to another. Uh, stream processing is basically giving you some kind of higher level capability to process that data once you get it. Um, so all, what we want to support this use case. This is very important for security or relevance applications. And the way that we're doing it is um, by just giving you the, the ability to partition up data by key and consume partition data. So it's very much like a, a MapReduce uh, kind of API. Um, the use case is not meant to replace Hadoop. It's really meant for these very low latency cases where you're trying to get something done in seconds instead of 
you know, minutes, hours, uh, days. And so, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about that just because I'm, you know, crunched for time. But, but it's, it's essentially a MapReduce API on top of these infinite streams instead of on top of uh, complete files as Hadoop is. Now, unlike Hadoop, we don't have all the features uh, to support multi-tenancy yet, right? Um, I, I think that comes with time, right? So there's no permissions or security or all that. Uh, but it does give you the ability to build these real-time processing flows, partition and repartition by keys, uh, and do on-the-fly processing, which is kind of exciting. Um, and so I, I gave an example, which I'm not going to go into, uh, but this is the classic web example, is trending topics. You want to compute this, and I gave some example flow. Um, so, so that's it for my talk. Um, I think the, if people are interested in contributing to this project, it's a fairly young project. It's up on GitHub. Uh, we're, we're working on moving it into uh, Apache that's up for vote now. Uh, there's a mailing list. Um, we're looking for help uh, on any kinds of features. So feel free to email me or the mailing list if you're, if you're interested in this or we want to try it out. Do producers send messages to Kafka using TCP or UDP? Uh, using TCP. TCP. So, so we actually looked at both. Mm -hmm. What we found is the big performance win actually comes from batching. Uh, and so you have to batch uh, in order to get full packets. And once you've done that, it actually doesn't make a huge difference whether you use UDP or, or TCP. Um, but Do you we guys have stateless clients in... on the front for where, like, for example, PC, for you, if you were having like PHP processes, mm -hmm. they would be making TCP connections all the time to Kafka, right? Because they can't hold an open yeah, TCP that's, connection. Yeah, so, so, so I think for, for PHP it is an issue. Uh, our front end is an MPHP, so we, we use persistent connections. Okay. Um, I think there is some ability to hold on to persistent connections in, in PHP, but I don't know a ton about it. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Hey, Jake. Uh, quick question. Um, <laughs> um, where are the uh, servers that are producing logs in relation to the, uh, the, the Kafka brokers? Are they co-located? Is there a separate set of machines? Yeah, when you say co-located, you mean like in the same data center? In the same box or on the same data center? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the producers are going to be uh, people doing real work, and the Kafka servers are separate. Um, okay. And so you would produce data to the Kafka servers in your local data center, and they would be sucked in from there to some local place or consumed directly, depending on the ap application architecture. Okay. So yeah, it's one always more, uh, Let me ask one more quick question. Sure. Um, for the persistence, do you do that locally on the Kafka boxes, or do you actually use HDFS as the Yeah, backing? so we're, we're locally. Basically, we didn't want to have real-time access to HDFS, so we are locally persisting these on the, on the Kafka servers. Hi. Uh, so for Hive, when you load data from mm -hmm. Kafka into Hive, how do you manage the schema of that? If if the producers are changing their schema and That's is right. the so, Hive so, table so staying up to date? Actually, that work is kind of unrelated to Kafka. What we've done is we've we've produced a, a cert date for Hive, and we've produced um, a, a load funk or whatever for Pig, which works with uh, Abra, and we have a, a central place that schemas are registered, and then we. For producers, we enforce compatibility semantics. So we say you can change things, and we will, we will handle your, your schema changes, but you can't make arbitrary changes. You can only make forwards, you know, backwards compatible changes, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that's because, because you have to maintain this data for you know, a period of time, a long period of time. It's not really feasible, or it's a pain in the ass, to go back and re-grandfather everything uh, all the time. So what we want is only to maintain uh, backwards compatible changes. It limits what you can do, but you can do most of what you want. And so the, you Sorry. So you update the Hive schema after you make the producer change? We, that's right. So, so I think effectively Hive always maintains the latest schema. And we're, we're using right. Avro to project forward to that latest schema so that old things that were stored there are getting default values or right. whatever when they're missing fields. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, actually, two questions. One is uh, if the Kafka a cluster, one of the nodes is down, mm -hmm. uh, how do you recover from that failure? Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any kind of um, solution for that? Yeah, so, so I think the, 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 there's a couple answers to that, right? Um, one is we don't have really good semantics when you publish a message on getting it onto multiple uh, machines. That's something we're working on. The other is how do you handle machines going up and down? They're registered in Zookeeper, so when the machine goes down, it will stop receiving messages, and people will stop consuming from it. Um, so the, right. the logs are persistent, but they're not uh, replicated across machines yet. Okay, so there's no replication. You have to handle um, the data Yeah, that's loss. right. That's something we're working okay. on. We haven't rolled it out. Okay, I see. A second one is um, about uh, RabbitMQ, mm -hmm. you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So what's the downside of that um, 
approach? So, so, so I think the, the, the thing, we, we, we published a paper recently on this, and if you want to get more Yeah, I, I would have loved to. Today, yeah, so I think the, the main problem we found is um, the consumer throughput is not, not quite as good, and the, the performance doesn't remain flat as the backlog of messages increases, and that's a big, that's a big issue, right? So, mm -hmm. so depending on how many messages are on the server, the, the server will get slower and slower. So we found that I to be see. true with ActiveMQ and RabbitMQ both. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. How do you deal with the transactionality between your main app database and Kafka? So like, for example, if a uh, you know, user invites someone else, mm -hmm. um, you make that change in your main app database, and then you record it in, or you send it to Kafka. Mm -hmm. So you want both those events either to succeed or mm -hmm. to fail. Um, how do you deal with that? So, so we, we don't. Basically, okay. um, the, the primary use right now is for um, tracking, metrics, and queuing. And it's used for some of these kind of change logs, but it's basically when something happens, it's published. It can be missed. I think right now we're not, there's no way to keep it in sync with your database unless you have something which always kind of pulls the database. And we're not using that as the main you know, subscription mechanism. So if you, if you want to do something like that, the way it's usually built, which is not what LinkedIn does, is you have some process that essentially pulls the database and puts it in. And that okay. means you, it can't be push-based. Otherwise, if the push fails, you never get the message. It has to be pull-based, so you always get the message whenever you come back to life if you fail. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. But it's not what we're doing, so. <laughs> um, so you said the GMS API is uh, broken and it's not it's weak. So what? Can you tell a bit, like, what did you gain by not being GMS compliant? Yeah, sure. So, so JMX basically, there's a, there's a couple issues with it. The first issue is they explicitly say J, JMS doesn't cover uh, anything to, having to do with distribution. And I think people who've worked on these kind of distributed systems before, it's very hard to have something which is designed to work on one machine, which just transparently goes to many. And so I think a lot of the problems come out of that. The second set of problems has to do with uh, the richness of the APIs they give you around messages. It's, the, the, it's so rich with respect to ordering that I think you essentially have to maintain you know, a database of metadata or whatever. You can't do what we do, which is just have these very simple linear files. That's going to be a huge performance hit, I, I think. Right. So, so we've done these comparisons against a bunch of messaging systems. And what we've seen is it's very easy for the messaging system to be fast when everything's in memory, because all of those, all that metadata kind of comes for free. As the data gets large, that strategy kind of falls apart, right? So those are the two, I think, limitations. So what we're doing is we have a much simpler uh, metadata subscription model, but it's very fast.